Uh, our next guest, I would like to in, uh, welcome Dr. Mamta Dindayal with a big round of applause. Ma'am, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Good afternoon. It's wonderful being here today. Thank you, Dr. Asha and Dr. Vijay. It was very kind that you asked me to come over, and I always love coming here. It was a very busy week last time, and uh, coming here was such a welcome change for me. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's nice to meet old friends, and um, I thank all of you for being here. And uh, my presentation is going to be something that is given with a purpose. And this purpose is to provoke all my colleagues sitting here to do and love ultrasound the way it transformed my life. May I know a show of hands of how many of us do ultrasound ourselves? OK. <clears throat> At the end of this session, I'm going to provoke everybody to do ultrasound. And that is why I'm having this pre-lunch, because pre-lunch is always nice, because you want to eat at the same time. You have to listen. You have no choice. With the lights off, pun intended, <clears throat> because um, you don't see what, how they react, and uh, it's the best way to go. In the past, we believe that making babies means you need a gynecologist. You need an ultrasound room where you wait for your chance amongst all the others. I always believed that ultrasound meant you needed a monitoring chart. Again, come back to your gynecologist saying, well, I'm ready now, I'm exhausted. There are other lucky ones like this who go home for a quickie and get pregnant. And a child is born. This is what we always believed it was. But we know that this is far from the truth. When it comes to treating patients of infertility, many more investigations are required. And the appropriateness of many of the investigations for infertility will continue to be a part of debate for some time, and that is why you have evidence-based management. The holy grail of subfertility investigation should be that it should be absolutely accurate in its diagnosis. It should offer an acceptable level of prognostic interpretation. It should have the least amount of delay, and it should be as less invasive as possible. Obviously, ultrasound fulfills all these criteria. So today, I'm going to take you for the next, do I have 45 minutes? Yes or no? You have the energy for it? OK. Because it's basically a teaching session, because uh, when I grew up in life, my father told me, that you teach best what you want to learn the most. And I always wanted to learn ultrasound. So today, we are going to talk about ultrasound-based subfertility management, evaluation, and treatment, the one-stop ultrasound-based approach, because I believe very firmly that all infertile patients should be scanned. There are four questions that need to be answered. Number one, which type of ultrasound is preferable? Number two, is there a systematic approach? Can the outcome be predicted by ultrasound? And is there an ultrasound-based approach to solve our problems? Are you with me? Because I'm going to answer these four questions to you. Which type of ultrasound? Of course, you have the abdominal ultrasound or the vaginal ultrasound. We being gynecologists, we always want to be at the woman's cervix. That's our motto, at your cervix. But you must always do an abdominal ultrasound. 
a transabdominal ultrasound's image resolution is poor, but it must always be performed particularly in every single patient that enters your clinic. Make it a rule to look at her kidneys, which are large structures in the abdomen, which you must see. I'll tell you over the lecture about the mistakes I made. Transvaginal ultrasound uses high frequency probes. The organs of interest are very close to the transducer. So when you actually look at the organs with your ultrasound, it appears as if they are magnified. It looks like you're looking at the organs with a microscope. And the mission impossible now becomes possible. Is there a systematic rational approach? So today, I'm going to take you for the next 10 minutes onto how I conduct a standard ultrasound examination on the female pelvis. Following this, I will take you through the diagnosis that we have made over time, the lessons we have learned, and so that it becomes useful to each and every one of you. The tips and tricks. The first step, my dear friends, before you go on to your ultrasound machine, is to optimize the image. And I'll tell you why. You have a picture like this. You know what you're going to see on laparoscope. You have a picture like this, you know it's a hydrosalpinx. Your patient understands it as well. You have an ultrasound reconstruction like this, you know her tube is going to be dilated. So how do you get these pictures? These are all pictures that I never copied from textbooks. So today my message to each one of you is very clear. The pictures that I took are the pictures on my machine. And when I can do it, you can do it as well. I very firmly believe that you can actually display what you thought. And I also believe that one picture speaks more than a thousand words. So let me take you now through the methodology that I follow, which is how we do it. This is the institute where I work. And this is a strict protocol that all of us at the Institute follow. The first is the history and documentation of the symptoms. The second, a transabdominal ultrasound, particularly to look at the kidneys. The third, we look at what I compartmentalize, the middle compartment, that is the uterus, cervix, and vagina. The next, is step four, where I look at the lateral compartments, that is the ovary and the adnexa. The next is the posterior, uh, the anterior compartment, which is the bladder and the ureter. I'm going to show you pictures. I'm, I will not talk off my hat. I'm going to show you real-time pictures. And the sixth is evaluation of the posterior compartment. That is the rectovaginal septum, the retrocervical area, the pouch of Douglas, the uterus acrils, and the intestines. So can I take you through these, yes or no? Yes? Are you all with me? All right. So coming to how you approach a patient. First, how you get started, introduce yourself to the patient. After all, you're doing a vaginal examination for a patient. So introduce yourself. Read the request form, enter the patient details, inform the patient about the aims of why you're doing a scan, gather the relevant history, stand at the side of the patient, never in between her legs, cover the patient because respect to the patient is extraordinarily important, keep a standardized, prefixed, determined technique, which I talked about, and start with a transabdominal scan first then a transvaginal. And today, if I can make my presentation to you, it is because I recorded all my video clips and my pictures. 
if you're good at ultrasound and you get invited to speak, you have your evidence with you. And so is it with your patients. Remember, these are the days of the consumer court. These are the days of the priest, the politician, and the lawyers. And if you have your images documented, you can stand in the court of law. Yes, as the person who called me onto stage introduced me and said it's a noble profession, sometimes I feel we are better off mid-air. So start with the transabdominal examination. Why? Why am I going on insisting on this? Because it gives you an overview of the pelvis. It tells you about the mutual relationships between two organs. It is easier to take measurements on transabdominal ultrasound. You will n avoid overlooking masses in the upper part of the pelvis. It allows you to see masses which are more than 10 centimeters. You can evaluate the kidneys as well. And it takes less than a minute. So I think you owe that to your patient. It's not necessary to have a full bladder. It's time consuming to have the patient to have a full bladder. Just a little urine in the bladder is all that is required. When you have too full a bladder, you're going to displace the organs in the pelvis and you must never do that. I have learned for the best results, start each scan with a clear conscience and empty your own bladder. When you're doing an abdominal scan, first do a longitudinal and then a transverse. Where does a trans abdominal scan score? It scores because you get a panoramic view and it is better to see unmarried women who come to you with an abdominal scan. Where does it score over a TBS? Sometimes you have a big fibroid in the upper part of the fundus which you can miss on transvaginal and that is where you can see it. For example, I would have normally missed this. I would have just said it's a normal uterus. The next is sub if you have a cervical fibroid, you can, it can, uh, the shadowing can obscure vision so that is where it helps. Suppose you have a uterus that is axially placed, you can miss a polyp. So if you have a dermoid, for example, you can see the dermoid much more clear when you do a transabdominal scan. So that is where it scores. So it's important that you do it. I have learned we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act but a habit. And I am saying this so many times because if you want to be excellent in ultrasound, you need to follow a strict protocol. Ultrasound, believe me, my dear friends, 75% is ultrasound, is cerebral, and 25 is manual. The steps, of course, are that when you're doing an ultrasound, you keep your probe, it has a mark on the top, make sure the mark is looking at the rooftop, only then you're going to get a sagittal section of the uterus. When you're doing an ultrasound, this is one of the take home messages. When you're doing an ultrasound, what differentiates you from somebody else is that you put the probe posteriorly towards the rectum while you're going into the vagina, go posterior and not anterior because you will avoid the urethral area and the anterior vagina, which has far more neural, in, uh, I mean, are, it's much more sensitive. So there are many patients who say, doctor, when you do the ultrasound, it doesn't hurt. But when X does the ultrasound, it hurts. That's the trick. You have to be one step better than somebody else. Now, when you're doing an ultrasound, there are certain steps. Please concentrate on this picture here. So while you're entering the, when you're doing your ultrasound, introduce the probe, withdraw it a bit, look at the cervix, and then follow it into the uterus. And whilst you're doing this, keep following the viscera above and below. I'm just trying to get my marker here. Watch the viscera on the top and in front. 
and see the movement of the viscera over the uterus. That will tell you straight away whether there are adhesions or not. The concept of the compartments. I told you earlier, you have a middle compartment. You have a lateral compartment, an anterior compartment, and a posterior compartment. So when you're doing your ultrasound, you always first go longitudinally and then move your probe in the anti-clockwise direction, go laterally from one adnexa to the other adnexa, then go anteriorly and then go posterior. You will never, ever miss a thing. Evaluation of the mid middle compartment, you have to look in longitudinal, in transverse, and of course, you do a 3D coronal section and confirm it by laparoscopy. The sagittal view of the uterus is going to tell you many things. So while you're doing your ultrasound, take the, take the whole screen beginning from the cervix to the fundus in the lateral view. It's the best, this sagittal section is the best to take your measurements and it also tells you a lot about the cervix, about the cervical canal, about the entire uterus. Then go in the anti-clockwise direction and look at the transverse section where, yeah, thank you. And the transverse section never ever measure the endometrium and transverse section. Use the transverse section to see any split in the endometrial cavity which may tell you that you're dealing with a bicornate uterus or a septate uterus. So you need to go in transverse plane. So just a 2D longitudinal and transverse is going to give you a lot of your diagnosis. But never ever forget to go in the coronal view. And it's very simple, please follow this. It's very simple to take a 3D picture. As you can see here, these are real-time pictures. You have the longitudinal, the transverse, the longitudinal, the coronal, and the reconstructed image. If there is one take-home message for you, it is, I will be talking to you about this case, but it is looking at the cervix. We always tend to forget looking at the cervix and we are concentrating only on the endometrium. Look at the cervical canal, take the widest dimension. Go to the uterus, take the widest dimension. See the ratio between the two. And if the ratio between the cervical length and the, I mean the cervical diameter and the uterine corpus diameter is more than one, suspect a problem. And I'm going to tell you about this in a moment. When you're looking at the cervix, look at the entire cervix, from the fundus down to the cervix. So from here to here, and you can see it in one shot in longitudinal section, we always do a 3D as well. And you can actually see the cervical os very clearly. Then go to the adnexa, very simple again. Go anti-clockwise, go in the transverse plane, go move it from the left side to the right side and look at the adnexa. It's very simple. I felt that I was never taught this, so I put this in this presentation before I tell you how you can use ultrasound to your advantage. How do you look at the ovaries? Of course, you identify the ovaries by the presence of antral follicles in the corpus luteum, but you, uh, you have to change differentiated from static structure. It's a static structure, you have to differentiate from the intestine, which of course you see the Brownian movements. And of course the presence of the uh, vessels will tell you. So how do you identify the cervix? Go laterally, identify the ovarian ligament, and there you see the ovary there. The next is the anterior compartment. This is very important because nobody taught me this. I learned this about two years ago, and I follow it very, very often. And in every case as well, when you're looking at the anterior compartment, look at the uterocycle fold of peritoneum and how it slips away and you know there are no additions. If you look at this picture here, you can see there is a mass here. And that is an endometriotic nodule. So just looking at the anterior compartment, you can make your diagnosis. 
watch this you can see this video this is a patient here you can see the f watch the uterus cervical fold uterovaginal fold it doesn't it just doesn't when you're trying to withdraw and push it back again it just doesn't move when we did a laparoscopy that's exactly what we saw the uterovaginal fold of peritoneum was adherent and this is a patient who had a previous classical cesarean and we could actually pick it up on ultrasound Then the ureter, this is very fascinating. This is something I've learned in the last one year and picked up quite a few abnormalities. And how do you identify the, uteri uh, the ureter? Just go laterally and you can actually see the peristalsis. You see this? You can actually see the peristalsis. Never forget to look at the ureteric jets, you can see it here. So it's very important that you look at this as well. We do this in every scan. Never forget to look at the posterior compartment, which means you, if you find that when you're pushing the vagina, when you're putting your probe inside and you're looking at the vagina and you see that you're able to move the organs posterior over the uterus serosa, you know there are no adhesions. Look at this picture on the other hand. You can see that when you're trying to push it, the intestines are adherent here. And this is a patient who had this picture. So you can pick even this up. Are you with me? OK. If you're not, I'm going to bring you back. So always look at the retrocervical area. You can actually pick up and retro, uh, you can pick up rectovaginal endometriosis, and you'll surprise your laparoscopic surgeon. If you see vaginal uh, nodule here, for example, you can see the nodule here, and you can see the rectovaginal adhesions. That's the picture. Here you can see bowel adhesions to the fundus, and that's the picture. Always, always when you're putting your probe in, look at the vagina at all times. So when you're putting your probe in, you see a hypoechoic area with a white line, which is a hyperechoic area, and that is where you can see the nodules. So you see this picture, you can actually see a hypoechoic nodule here, and you know that the patient complains of pain. So when you're doing a laparoscopy, you can say, okay, you have a vaginal nodule that needs to be excised. It's very important. This is something I learned in the last six months. So let me tell you a little about this. Put the probe posteriorly in the vagina and follow the intestines. You can actually follow the intestines. That's the lumen, that's the wall, and that's the muscularis. You must follow the intestines up to 20 centimeters. Believe me, the number of diagnoses of intestinal endometriosis we made was amazing and you can see it here when you follow this is the rectosigmoid that is bending over you follow it and as you follow it as you follow the intestine you can actually see a big nodule here so that's the intestine there keep following it down and you can see there's a large intestinal endometriotic nodule. Did you see that? Even the uterosacrals are very easily assessed by transvaginal ultrasound. When you're doing an ultrasound, the take home message from today's meet is make it dynamic. When you're doing your ultrasound, see whether the organs around it are moving look for pain because pain is going to tell you what you should see and you have two hands with one hand you use on the abdomen the other hand with the probe goes into the vagina and between them you can actually make great diagnosis always keep your ultrasound dynamic for example in this case you don't see the movement of the bowel over the serosa and that's what the picture you'll see so this is called a slight sign negative pain mapping is very important and if you see this that is the ovary that's a cyst 
So try to go in between them and you can split the ovary from the cyst. So you know you are dealing with a para-ovarian cyst. Should a Doppler be used? Dr. Nagori was speaking about this. This patient came, when I just put a Doppler in the cervix, I, I'm very passionate about the cervix, and when I put a Doppler, I saw something was giving me directions. And this girl had a malignant polyp in the cervix. So you can see transvaginal ultrasound is going to give you a lot of invest information. It's an extension of your finger. For example, in this case, transabdominal didn't show me anything. When I did a transvaginal ultrasound, I saw peripheral vascularity and confirmed on hysteroscopy. So that is why we investigate the couple in a one-step approach. A good gynec ultrasound is going to give you an approach and direction. So having done this, now let's go quickly. Are you still with me? Do you think I can continue? Yes? Yes, yes or no? OK. So we'll go to the uterine evaluation. First, assess is the uterus antiverted. It is bending over the bladder. Is it retroverted when it is away from the bladder or its mid position? Do a 2D of the uterus. Look at the cervical canal. Look at the cervix. Look at the myometrium and the endometrium, and of course the serosa all the way. Dr. Naguri has already talked to us about how the endometrium thickens and becomes a type 4 endometrium. With but the most important thing, when you're looking at a 3D of the uterus, remember you must look at the cervical canal, the cavity, and you can see the cornual ends here. And just below the uterine cavity is a hypoechoic area, and this is the junctional zone. This is the most important, and I'll show you with examples. Look at the myometrium, look at the serosa. You can see the junctional zone is normal here, but you can see there's a loss of junctional zone here. And what did we see on laparoscopy? It was adenomyosis. In this case, you can see hyperechoic areas within the endometrial cavity and total loss of junctional zone. This is tuberculosis. See the diagnosis? You don't, it's just you make the diagnosis right away. Then, of course, looking at the 3D of the uterus, you need to measure from cornu to cornu and see the depth. If it is more than one centimeter, you know there is a septum of some kind or an anomaly of the uterus. So here, I'm giving you some examples here is a unicornate uterus and a mass on the side that's a rudimentary horn and that's the laparoscopic picture. So you can make your diagnosis even before the surgeon puts his scope in. Here is a patient who came with severe, she was an unmarried girl and her only problem was severe intractable dysmenorrhea. I did a, this is a rectal scan. The rectal scan showed a unicornate uterus and a hematometra in the non-canalized horn. We did a hemihysterectomy for her, and of course she's absolutely all right, delivered a normal child after, the, after five years, and she's doing well. This is a patient, when you see a split, it may be a bicornate uterus confirmed by laparoscopy. So you don't need too much of guessing when you do your ultrasound well. Here, of course, it's anybody's guess, widely separated uh, endometrial echoes and a 3D already shows the presence of a didelphus uterus. And this patient went ahead, we, uh, we induced ovulation with clomiphene citrate and gonadotropins and she conceived spontaneously one in both the, I mean she had a didelphus uterus with one sac in each of her uterine. So she had a double caesarean I think. So. You have septate uterus, you can make out the different types of septate uterus, whether it's a complete septum or a partial. And of course, you can plan your hysteroscopy. In this case, she was an unmarried girl. Can I go ahead? Is it okay to go ahead? Because it's, um, it's one o'clock nearly. Is it okay? Okay. Uh, this was a patient who reported to us, she's a primary infertility, married three years, very innocent looking husband. I think women are pretty dangerous, you know. She 
very innocent looking husband and he brought her and he said well she's not conceiving i did a history uh, i did a ultrasound and what did i find i found a hyperechoic area here i did a 3d reconstruction and what did i see i saw fetal bones which i suspected to be fetal bones i tapped her on the back and i said did you have an mtp in the past she said no and then when we put the hysteroscope we took out fetal scapula so never go by the history this is another case come in for ivf because she failed recanalization i did an ultrasound i found a hyperechoic area here i did a 3d reconstruction the hyperechoic area persisted i didn't know what it was the only history was she had a tubectomy and she lost her two children in the tsunami she came back for a re for a recanalization uh, in some center a recanalization was done in madras she failed to ivf cycles and when she came to me the only thing i saw was this hyperechoic area and to my surprise when i did a hysteroscopy i saw a bit of proline which was out of the tube probably the doctor who was doing the recanalization forgot to pull out the proline after reconstruction and all i did in hysteroscopy was pull this out it was a huge segment of proline and she conceived spontaneously after this non viable option commercially but you have done a lot of justice to your patient this is another case a young girl thick endometrium on day 2 we did a sonohistrography i could see very clearly she had polyps so i said okay you have polyps but i put on the 3d and what did i see she had her uterus full of polyps so you can actually show the patient this is why i need to do a hysteroscopy for you and justify a sonohistrography should always be done when you suspect an intracavitary lesion let's look at fibroids why should i do a 3d for a fibroid the answer is you can actually make out the location of the fibroid whether it's pressing over the junctional zone and if it is not touching the junctional zone you can leave it alone if it is less than 4 cm so these are the different fibroids that we saw from here you could see a little coronal fibroid and here you can actually see the vascularity so you can guide your surgeon and say you know what she has vascularity at the base and this is where you must anticipate it adenomyosis here you can differentiate there's a thickening of the endometrium there's a lot of vascularity and you can see these extra bits that go in from the myo endometrium into the myometrium these are little streaky structures which make a diagnosis of adenomyosis let me tell you a few case studies this is a very interesting case she is a 23 year old woman a doctor by profession when she came to me the first time she had already had six clomiphene citrate cycles and failed when i did an ultrasound for her i always have got this fixation about the junctional zone so when i did an ultrasound on day 3 she had a thick endometrium her pregnancy test was negative so i said okay you know what come back after 2 days i saw the same thick endometrium but i started looking at the junctional zone i saw distortion of the junctional zone so i put my doppler and on day 2 you see the fire here I saw a lot of vascularity. So under ultrasound guidance I did a biopsy and it was an invasive adenocarcinoma in a 23 year old. This having learned this anybody with a thick endometrium I'm a little more careful and this was another woman she had an endometrial sampling just 2 months ago because of a thick endometrium at another center it showed only secretory phase and nothing else but again again thick endometrium loss of junctional zone i put the doppler and what did i see there was fire i could li literally see fire in the endometrium there was so much of vascularity doppler the ri was less than 0.4 and i did a hysteroscopy and this is what i saw she had a polyp which was a malignant polyp and all we did was under hysteroscopy this again was an infiltrating adenocarcinoma young women here she was 
report she came with a cyst in the ovary she said but when I did an ultrasound and looked at my favorite cervix I saw this was a cyst in the cervix so we went ahead did a uh, hysteroscopy and that is how the hysteroscopy showed the cyst so you can make your diagnosis you don't need too much of too much to say now here this was the interesting case from which I learned my lessons when I saw this lady she had a mass in the cervix I measured this diameter and I measured the corpus diameter this diameter the ratio was more than two so I went into the details of the ultrasound and I saw this mass very clearly here and I put a vascularity study when you look at the cervix it looks so innocent but when I put the vascularity sub, sub, uh, in the cervix when I put the Doppler on there was fire in the cervix and we did a biopsy and this was again a squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix these are some of the lessons that I learned and I put them across for you having talked enough about the uterus let's go to the ovary what do you look in a normal ovary you look at the size the volume of the ovary the texture when we look at the anterior follicle count the stromal component you look at its relationship with the surroundings you look at the slight sign the ovarian stromal PSV look for abnormalities and synchrony with the endometrium and of course we know as Dr. Um, Nagori had already talked that it has a great role to play as far as the reproductive medicine is concerned always measure the ovary in three planes take the volume because the volume is going to give you an insight into whether she's a higher responder if the volume is more than 12 if she's a normal responder if it is between if it is less than 10 centimeter cube and if she's a poor responder if the volume is less than three we always do an antral follicle count in all our patients because that allows us to uh, to um, plan her stimulation protocol and because we have 3D machines we can actually now count our antral follicle count by what is called the Sono AVC and these are real pictures how does this help if you see m less than 5 follicles total follicle count you know it's a poor responder if it is between 5 and 15 you know it's a normal responder and if it is more than 15 you know you're dealing with the polycystic ovaries now another take home message when you're looking at the ovaries just don't look at the ovary per se look at the surrounding structures if you see here and if you watch this you can actually see the ovaries there and you can see a mass there that's a hydrocelpinx if you look at this you can see the ovaries adhering to the posterior surface of the uterus this is a story I cannot stop telling you this was a patient who came to me for IVF and consistent these were the early days of IVF I saw the right ovary I said okay five antral follicle count the left ovary not visualized ever so I said okay and we started stimulation she came back with hyperstimulation syndrome and I know that I just got four oocytes on retrieval I didn't understand why she was going into hyperstimulation syndrome her abdomen was full of fluid she recovered from the antral uh, from the hyperstimulation and during that time I looked under the liver and there were there was a big cyst there I didn't understand we put in a laparoscope in the subsequent cycle and what did we see an absent ovary on the left side but where was the ovary it was under the liver so my statement again never miss your abdominal ultrasound had I done the ultrasound in the first visit I would have never had hyperstimulation in this patient always look for the mobility and exclude endometriosis look at the stromal blood flow I think Dr. Nagori has very beautifully elicited this look at the eco texture of the ovary is it normal is it abnormal do a 3d capture look at these pictures this is a 3d capture so I did a laparoscope after that look at that picture can you see the similarity do you need more pictures do you need more explanations certainly not when you're looking at pathology in the ovary look whether the pathology is 
inside the ovary or outside it. Look for an ovarian mass in the vascularity and also look whether there are papillae and this is an adeno, a papillary serous cyst adenoma. Assessment of ovarian pathology is self-explanatory. You can see these pictures. I don't even need to speak. Endometriosis can be very easily recognized by pattern recognition, and these are some pictures. Polycystic ovaries, you don't need any more guesswork here. You do the antral follicle count. If the antral follicle count is more than 12, if you see peripherally arranged follicles, these are all real-time pictures. If you see the volume is more than 10, the stroma is marked increase in the stroma and the PSV is more than 10, then you know you're dealing with polycystic ovaries. So in the last 10 slides that I have, let's see what are the different ovarian pathologies. You may have a normal ovary, you may have a cyst in the ovary, you may have a benign tumor in the ovary, you may have a borderline tumor, a malignant tumor, or a metastatic tumor. Is it premenopausal? Is it postmenopausal? You need to assess. So let me quickly go through this. If you see in a woman premenopausal, young re reproductive age group, you just see a cyst, you can ignore it most of the time. But the same, because you know her chance of having a malignancy is only 0.54%. However, if the cyst occurred in a postmenopausal woman who has a history of malignancy in the family, particularly ovarian or breast, then you're slightly more cautious. Find out whether it's a multilocular cyst. If it is a solid cyst, whether there are cystic spaces in it, so it's called unilocular solid or multilocular solid, these are the worst. Look at its content. Is it anechoic, hypoechoic, ground glass appearance, hyperechoic or otherwise? Look at its external appearance. Is it regular? Is it irregular? This means malignancy. Always look at the inner wall profile. Is it smooth? Is it irregular? Because if you have a unilocular solid, you have a 37% chance of being malignant. If it is multilocular solid and she or a solid, it is 43 to 65% chance of being malignant. Always study the vascularity and grade it. Having done this, look for septa whether they are complete or incomplete. Look for papillae. You don't call everything a papillae. If the papillae is more than seven millimeters projection into the cyst, then it's called a papilla. You see whether you study the papilla in detail, the number of papillae that are there and the vascularity. And if you see very vascular papilla, you can be rest assured that you're dealing with a malignancy. So you have what are called the simple rules. So if you have a single cyst, regular margins, anechoic, no papillae, regular outer border, regular inner border, it's benign. If you have, on the other hand, solid, irregular mass, papillae more than four, multiple papillae which are vascular, it's malignant. These are called the simple rules. If you have even one, Mal malignant sign, you call it malignant. If you don't have, if all are benign, then you call it benign. And if it is a combination of two, you call it indiscriminate. So let me quickly tell you how we manage ovarian lesions. You use the IOTA simple rules. It may be benign or malignant, like I told you, or it may be indeterminate. And if it is indeterminate, you follow what is called the prediction models, the logistic regression models. And then again, you can make out whether it's benign or malignant or indiscriminate, in which case then you start doing your tumor marker tests to make it benign or malignant. How do you evaluate the tubes? Of course, you have the hyco C. It's not available in India. So you can check the tubes with saline. I'm not particularly comfortable doing it, though most of my colleagues do it all the time. You can look at the coronal ends and look for intraluminal blocks like this one. And of course, if you see a unilocular cyst with incomplete septum and reconstructed, you can get a hydrosalpings. And this was such a pretty picture, I actually wanted to frame it and put it up in my drawing room. 
you need to diagnose this well in advance because you have to counsel your patient regarding salpingectomy. So my last three slides. A gynec ultrasound, always take the history, clinical findings and note them down. Do a trans abdominal and transvaginal because they complement each other. Carefully look at your 2D. When in doubt, seek the help of books, the internet, seniors, and do not report till then. When you're reporting your ultrasound, describe the morphology, give the structure of origin, give your impression, give a line diagram, and that is what will make you different from the others. A differential diagnosis and supportive investigations can be mentioned. And this is how we give our report in the institute. And now coming to my last slide. When you practice as a soloist, to become perfect, you need 10,000 hours. To join an orchestra, you need 8,000 hours. To become a teacher, 6,000 hours of teaching. By the age of 20, nobody reached exclusive levels without massive areas of practice. Nobody did great practice and failed. For example, if you look at Mozart, by the age of six, he had 6,000 hours of practice on music. So what am I trying to get at? Experience, experience and purposeful practice will make you successful. But the take home message is, remember to be good at ultrasound. To be good, you must practice practice and practice. And that, my dear friends, is experience. I thank you very much for a very patient lesson. Doctor, thank you very much. I guess that is the most uh, captivating presentation that I have seen ever. Thank you very much for being, uh, giving that knowledge to us and being a part of this Garbhagnan 2014.